Hi, welcome to Torah Tuesday. Um, today we've got Genesis 15, 16, and uh, the the plot of the Abraham story thickens in these two chapters. We're going to spend most of our time talking about chapter 15 uh, and touch quickly on chapter 16. So when we left Abraham, or Abram, uh, he was rejecting a gift from the king of Sodom at the end of chapter 14. And uh, the reason he was doing that is because he had sworn an oath to God that he wouldn't accept anything from that dodgy king of Sodom. And so chapter 15 begins, and God is comforting Abraham uh, about turning down the gifts. He says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Or, or maybe he says, Your reward will be great. And so God's comforting him because he's turned down these gifts. But Abraham responds by pointing out, that so far, none of God's promises have materialized for him. Um, he doesn't even have a son yet, let alone the land of Canaan, which is the things that God has promised him. Now, I want to ask the question, is this moment, this questioning, is this a moment of disobedience? Well, Abraham is calling out to God as he tries to live in the gap between God's promises and their fulfillment. It's, it's just like the psalmist who says, How long, O Lord? Uh, Or the Christian who cries, Come, Lord Jesus. I think that this response is only natural from Abraham, just as how long, O Lord, or come, Lord Jesus, are only natural from us. It's It's not about doubting or being disobedient. It's a matter of trusting that God's promises will come. And it's just the waiting. It's the gap between the promise and their fulfillment. So at this point, God clarifies the promise further uh, that he has for Abram. So he says, verse 4, The word of the Lord came to him. This man, talking about Eliezer of Damascus, uh, the person who Abram thought might be his, his heir, this man will not be your heir, says God, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then they, t- they go outside and God says, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then God said, So shall your offspring be. So that clarifies the descendants question. Uh, There's going to be a lot. They're coming. God promises it will come from Abram's flesh and blood. But what about the promise of the land? God says, verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. And so Abram questions God again. Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? And then we have this funny and obscure story. God instructs Abram to set up uh, a covenant ritual. He is to cut five animals in half and set them up in two rows uh, with an aisle down the middle. So Abram does that and then he drives off the birds of prey as they come to eat the animals. Uh, And after that, he falls into a deep sleep. And while he is sleeping, God reveals to him the nature of how his family will take possession of the land. And then a cauldron of fire and a fiery torch pass down between the dead animals. Uh, And this this cauldron of fire represents God, as God is often described as a consuming fire in the Torah. And as as he does this, he tells Abraham exactly how it is that his family will take possession of the land. Verse 13, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So God tells him, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. Now, this this um, ritual that God gets him to set up, it's probably an ancient contractual agreement. I think the, the way that people understand it is that if the parties do not hold to their end of the agreement, let them be like the animals that have been torn in two. Um, and they walk down the aisle to symbolize that. But did you notice that Abram himself doesn't walk down the aisle? It's only God who walks down the aisle. G- Abram sleeps while this happens. Uh, So this is essentially, it's a one-sided contract. God is saying, I will do this. Um, Now, probably 
the most significant part of this story is the part that we've actually passed over, which is verse 6. In verse 6, the narrator says, Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, it's a rare moment in a Hebrew story when the narrator will describe or interpret um, the emotions or feelings of one of the people in the story. Usually we just get subtle details that we have to interpret for ourselves. Uh, but, but here we are told that Abraham trusts God and that that is a very significant thing. Abram's side of the deal is to trust God. Uh, he might, in this chapter, he might sound as if he is doubting God or if he's questioning God, but his actions so far in the, the Abram story have demonstrated that he trusts God, even if he does make some fatally stupid mistakes along the way. Uh, and this, this is a really important verse because it introduces the theme of righteousness based on faith. Uh, and that will be an important theme throughout the Bible. This is how Paul tells us that in the New Testament that we are justified in front of God. We are justified through faith in God. Our faith is credited to us as righteousness, not our works. That's not how we get right before God. It's not through obedience. It's not by attendance or quiet times or diligence or zeal uh, or sinlessness. We are justified by faith just like Abraham was. Martin Luther said that justification by faith is the doctrine on which the church of God stands or falls. It is the essence of Christian religion. It's not about works. God's faithfulness and our trust, that is the essence of Christian religion. Now, just quickly, I want to deal with the second story. This is only going to take a moment. Uh, There's two things that I want to point out about the Sarah and Hagar story. Firstly, Hagar, her name, it means immigrant. Remember, Hagar is from Egypt. Now, it might be worth rereading the story and reminding yourself that the story is speaking to the Egyptian enslavement story that will happen in the Exodus. What is this story saying? Um, We have here a harsh ruler who takes advantage of an immigrant But here it's actually the Hebrew woman who takes advantage of the Egyptian woman. Woman. Isn't that interesting? Second part of the thing I want to point out that I think is really interesting about this story. Who is doing the right and wrong thing here? It's it's a bit vague because Sarah seems to be doing the wrong thing. Abram seems to be doing the wrong thing. Is Hagar doing the wrong thing? It's all very strange. Like I said, there's not much commentary. There's just subtle hints. Uh, But I think some of those subtle hints will show us that This story actually sounds a lot like the Genesis 3 story. A wife comes to her husband and proposes that he takes something for himself. Uh, He passively accepts it, and then the blame shifting ensues. You see how this is just another Genesis 3 story happening all over again? Do you see how these stories, they all speak to each other? Isn't it just wonderful? Isn't the Torah great? Anyway, enjoy your week. See you next Tuesday.